Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. I'm Troy Mullen. Thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Let's jump right in to today's broadcast. And lately on the show, it seems like we've been talking about feed costs a lot. For most livestock operators, a big chunk of their production costs will go toward feeding their animals. Hugo Ramirez works in the Animal Science Department at Iowa State University. He says there are some keys to producing high quality corn silage. Just remember the five C's. The first is content and Hugo recommends an optimum dry matter range of 32 to 35 percent. What we want in there is to have a combination of nutrients and, and biomass and with that 32 to 35 percent dry matter we are able to obtain a good combination of digestibility of fiber, starch content in the plant for the for the animal and also the sugar content of the plant is going to be high so it is important to, to keep those sugars in the plant so if we go way outside of that range and say when it's getting too dry, then we have less sugars. We're going to have more starch, but less sugar. So it's going to be uh, much harder to, to ferment. For the next C, chopping. Three quarters of an inch is a good number for the silage. The reason for that is that it's going to be a, a particle size that packs well, but it also provides physically effective fiber for the animal. So that means that it's going to help or maintain rumen health and the animal can, uh, can maintain regular digestive processes. And because loose silage is lost silage, proper compaction and covering shouldn't be ignored. Uh, we want to obtain at the very least 15 pounds of uh, dry matter per cubic foot, and that would be a good indicator that we have done a good job packing. So that means that we're uh, excluding or pretty much squeezing out as much air as we can to allow uh, fermentation that is anaerobic or oxygen free. If we don't have that, then oxygen will come back in and will start to spoil. And what happens is that when there's oxygen present, the forage might have some natural uh, yeast on it. And as it ferments, the yeast will be consuming some of the lactic acid that we want there to preserve the forage, but the yeast will be consuming that. And as they are consuming this, they are consuming nutrients that we wanted to save uh, for the cow otherwise. After we, uh, we pack the silage, we use oxygen barriers and it's a very, uh, very thin film that it has, I, I like to call it more of a physical protection, it's almost like a chemical slash physical protection because those are engineered films that contain some polymer that pretty much repel oxygen. And then we put the black and white plastic on top to protect from the elements. The final C is care. So content, chop, compaction, covering, and care. We've got a link with more information on the Market Journal website. Next up, producers looking to learn more in crop production and management will want to mark their calendars for the Crop Management Diagnostic Clinics later this month. There will be three clinics, each with its own focus, soil health, soybean production, and corn production. There will be speakers for each session and the chance to hear research-based information, one-on-one -on -one interaction, and hands-on demonstrations. Nebraska Extension's Keith Gluen says it's necessary to have an understanding of the resources you're working with, whether it's the soil or the crops you're growing. He joined us to break down each clinic. Participants will have the opportunity to get in the soil pits, uh, to learn how landscape position influences the, the, uh, the soil quality. Uh, they'll learn about how chemical processes over time influence soil quality factors, soil health factors, as well as physical and biological properties. So we have faculty from the University of Nebraska as well as scientists from the USDA a Natural Resource Conservation Service that will serve as instructors on this topic. Hopefully they, the take home message is here are some of the things I can do in my farming operation. Here are some of the things I can do maybe in my garden to improve soil health, soil quality factors. In the soybean production, uh, we have uh, <coughs> Dr. Jim Speck, who is a renowned um, soybean physiolo physiologist from the University of Nebraska, and he has uh, planted plots where we will demonstrate different 
concepts associated with soybean production. Uh, Dr. Nathan Mueller uh, will also um, be addressing soil fertility aspects of soybean production. And then we will cover the soybean insect world, the plant disease world, uh, and, and so forth. If you've got young people in your operation that maybe um, went off to the big city, so to speak, and uh, didn't have a degree in, in agriculture, but came back to the farm, I think it's really important they have an understanding of what they're working with as far as the growth and development of the soybean plant. And in the world of corn, uh, what we've done is we started planting corn on April 16th and we planted a 102 day and 115 day hybrid. And we've continued planting every seven to 10 days those hybrids. So on August 28th, participants will see corn that's physiologically mature and they'll see corn that's in its early vegetative stages of growth and everything in between. Okay, so here are the details. The Soil Health Clinic is August 22nd, the Soybean Clinic is August 27th, and the Corn Clinic is August 28th. All three will be at the Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center. We've got more information, including speakers, topics, costs, and registration on the Market Journal website. Time for markets now, and we're talking to this week's analyst about how the recent acreage report is impacting the cattle markets. Plus, we'll get a check on the state of beef exports, and a Tyson plant in Kansas is making some disruptions in the market. What does all of this mean? Dr. Daryl Peel is our analyst this week. He's a livestock marketing specialist with Oklahoma State University Extension, and he joins us now. Thanks for being here, Daryl. You bet. And for starters, let me ask you about the acreage report that was released on Monday. What were some of the major takeaways for you and maybe for some of the folks that you've talked to as well? Well, you know, there was lots of anticipation of this number. We've had so much uncertainty this summer about uh, the fundamentals of the corn market. Uh, you know, we, we normally know acreage by now. We still don't. This report helps a little bit, although I think you would find a lot of uh, a range of opinions about that. USDA uh, didn't pull the acreage number down nearly as much as a lot of folks thought. So, um, you know, so I think there's still a lot of uncertainty. That's one issue going forward. If USDA is close uh, at this point in time, then we're going to have a significantly bigger corn crop than a lot of people have expected as a result of all the challenges this year. Uh, and that certainly then would, would take the bloom off of this uh, corn market relative to what we've sort of uh, uh, talked about over the last uh, six or eight weeks. Uh, and that would suggest that we had that, uh, that sort of threat of higher corn prices, which maybe is not going to pan out to be as much reality going forward. Yeah, kind of give us a breakdown of how these corn prices are going to be felt throughout the cattle market. Well, you know, in the cattle market side, obviously higher corn prices translates into a higher cost of gain. And I think, you know, relative to what we would have thought, say, early in the year, uh, we're still going to see somewhat higher prices. But the real question now is, is sort of how much higher. Um, you know, going forward, I think we moderate that from expectations or from the, uh, the situation, say, a month ago. Um, and so it, they're, they're probably modestly higher. Uh, they will have some impact then on, you know, that, that bakes back into feeder cattle prices as well. Uh, so there'll be some, some impacts on that going forward, but I think we're now talking about uh, much more modest kinds of impacts compared to what we feared uh, just a short time ago. And moving on to beef exports for a minute. Uh, beef exports have been in the news, especially with the recently announced trade deal with the EU. So could you give us an overall sense of how beef exports have been and what you see looking ahead? Well, I think in a bigger picture sense, obviously the EU agreement is good news. It's not a major factor. It's still a relatively minor part of it, but certainly good news and, and provides some, some additional access in a, in a tough market that, that in terms of the U.S. getting access. In a bigger picture sense, so far this year, the, the beef trade picture uh, has been a little different than the last three years. We've seen uh, uh, an increase in, in imports so far this year, although the June imports were actually down, but for year to date, they're up a little bit. On the export side, uh, you know, May and June exports were about flat with year ago levels, but for the year to date, we're down just a little bit. So there's a little more challenge in this trade picture, not as uh, helpful as it has been. It's not really a major negative factor, but certainly not as helpful as it has been over the last uh, couple of years. And something else making news, not necessarily good news here, Daryl, a fire at a Tyson Foods packing facility in western Kansas has the potential to really disrupt the market. 
So when you look at the numbers, how important is this Tyson plant to the industry? Well, it's a big impact. Uh, you know, this was a huge fire at a large facility that accounts for approximately 5% of our slaughter capacity. Uh, so it's a very noticeable disruption. We've already seen major uh, reaction in the markets to this, uh, to this plant closure. Uh, the initial impacts, of course, are the biggest and they will uh, you know, diminish over time as the, the rest of the industry, as well as Tyson, have a, a chance to sort of react and, and make some adjustments going forward. But it, it's a huge impact. It's liable to have uh, ripple effects for several weeks, if not potentially up to several months in the market. Uh, we've seen something like this before. Uh, in 2000, a ConAgra plant in that same region uh, basically burned to the ground and never reopened. And so we have a little bit of history and there's been actually some research done to show kind of what those impacts were. It does take several weeks to work their way out. Uh, one of the things that may be a little bit different this time compared to then is that uh, packing capacity is a little bit tighter in the beef industry and this plant represents a little bit bigger proportion of it. Uh, so that gives us a little less flexibility, but there are uh, several other major plants in that same region. It's the biggest concentration of beef plants in the country. Uh, so there'll be opportunities for these other plants to sort of offset, at least partially offset, uh, this, the disruptions that come from this plant closure. And finally, Daryl, any other marketing or risk management advice that you'd like to leave us with today? Well, you know, I guess uh, this, this shock in terms of the, uh, the plant fire in Kansas uh, is a reminder to this industry that we're always subject to, uh, you know, shocks uh, on the spur of the moment. Uh, they create a lot of uh, concern and issues and so on, but they also really highlight the, uh, the importance for producers to stay as nimble as possible. Um, you know, for many producers right now, uh, relative to this, this latest shock, I would say time is on our side. Uh, I wouldn't panic too much, particularly for feeder cattle markets. Uh, you know, we're gonna, we haven't really changed the overall fundamentals uh, in those markets. So as time goes on, these initial shocks will work their way out. And I think that's a general lesson that we can take in terms of sort of, again, trying to stay as prepared as we can. Uh, obviously, at some point you have to pull the trigger and make a decision, uh, but uh, as much as possible, the, uh, the more flexibility you can maintain, the, the better off you may be to withstand these kind of shocks. Thanks to Dr. Peel. Darren Newsom will join us next week. Next up, Jimmy Frederick of Rulo is known for his accolades in reaching high soybean yields. Frederick set the national record for soybean yield in 2018 when he harvested 138 bushels. However, he's also been pushing the limit on his corn yields, and lately he set his sights on 250 to 300 bushels per acre. And this is all while trimming back his nitrogen fertilizer applications. At the foundation of his nitrogen program is the biologic activity of the soil, and that comes from applications he uses. You can read about Frederick's biological applications and his nitrogen management in the August Nebraska Farmer. Well, Al Dutcher is here with weather, and Al, how's it look out there? Well, Troy, we've had a fairly active week across the state. We had precipitation come through this last weekend, and then we had several Ridge runners moved through the state. The more significant one was Wednesday night into Thursday morning that caught a substantial portion of north central through southeastern Nebraska and just clipped portions of east central Nebraska. And then we had another follow up complex move through during the overnight hours. So we have caught up a little bit on the precipitation, especially in those drier areas of the state, although we are still showing some deficits. At least this will give us some limited relief with the hope that more precipitation will come down the line as we get into the later part of the month. But overall, it does look like our most active period of weather will be this weekend, and then we'll start to see a drying trend and a warming trend as we go through much of next week. So if we look at the upper air models, we have this little troughing pattern across southern Canada, extending into Nebraska, bringing that cooler air in, and also a zonal flow to move these systems in a rather rapid fashion to our east. Low pressure in the Texas Panhandle has a little bit of moisture that's trying to stream northward, and with this high pressure sagging in, there'll be a convergence zone as the warm front tries to lift. This might induce some precipitation this morning across southeast Nebraska and some thunderstorm development later this afternoon, although the, most of the activity should move to our east as that trough starts to pivot to our east tomorrow. Do show low pressure in, the, in developing in the southwestern portion of Kansas, and that will probably induce some thunderstorm activity in Missouri and southern Iowa before we start to see the ridge building into our region as we go into Monday and much warmer conditions in stores. We return back to the upper 80s and low 90s. Low pressure at the surface in southwest Kansas doesn't have any moisture to work with as the primary feed of moisture 
remains to our south, and most of it will concentrate around the Gulf Coast region, leaving much of the eastern Corn Belt high and dry, and then that trough kind of weakens as it moves toward the east. Ridge really starts to take force across the western United States. These low pressure systems to our south really don't have anything in moisture to work with. So if we do see some thunderstorm activity, maybe some pop-up showers in portions of central Kansas. By Wednesday, the core of the high pressure system will be over north central Kansas, south central Nebraska. So we're probably looking at the hottest temperatures of the week. Low pressure in northwest Kansas may induce a few thunderstorms as we get a little bit of monsoonal fetch around the periphery of this high. And on Thursday, it looks like the high will try to build back to the north a little bit. Low pressure sits in west central Kansas does have a little moisture feed to the north, but once again, there's just no dynamics aloft to force significant thunderstorm activity, although one complex is shown to move down the Missouri River Valley as we go through Thursday night into Friday, and then Friday yet another trough starts to move out, or a little wave moves out of the central Rockies, might induce some precipitation in western Nebraska as the main surface low means to our north. So you see the high concentration of precipitation across the northern Missouri River Valley and in the southwestern United States, but more importantly, as we go into the extended forecast, that high pressure ridge looks like it's going to hold into place. And that should help uh, in terms of temperatures, keeping us consistently in the 90s. And it looks like for the most part, this is not going to break down until we get to late in the month at the earliest. And in terms of precipitation, with that ridge in pace, most of the precipitation can be forced across the northern plains and, of course, across the Gulf Coast where we have a couple of systems that are going to be moving along the Gulf Coast to induce moisture. But more importantly, as we look out into the future, the newest 30-day forecast does indicate that most of the Corn Belt will receive basically normal temperatures and in terms of colder than normal conditions, that'll be relegated to the Dakota. So we'll see whether that verifies or not. We need to see the warmth to get this crop to the finish line. And no, Troy, it does look like very warm conditions for the vast majority of next week. Thanks, Al. Moving on, and a new pest has been popping up in soybean fields the last couple of years and is giving some producers headaches. As early as this June, soybean gall midge larva was found in plants at the Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center. And little by little, researchers are unraveling the mysteries of this pest. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has more. Thanks, Troy. This pest is still fairly new to researchers and with little data to go on, Nebraska Extension specialists and educators are trying to learn all they can when it comes to the soybean gall midge. This particular pest was first seen as early as 2011, however last year it became very clear early on that damage from the pest could be significant. Now, there's much more backing this year for researchers to understand its biology, and as a member of the genus Roselia, it's part of about 56 species now known in the United States and the only species of that genus to be problematic for soybeans. This year, as of August 7th, six new counties have been identified in Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota. All total, there are 86 counties across five states that have documented soybean gall midge infestations. However, since it's known that the species is troublesome around field edges, it's recommended to scout all of your soybean fields, regardless if you see the pest or not. Dead or dying soybean plants could be covered by healthy ones. On top of that, you should be sure to examine plants that are still green for larvae. In the meantime, researchers have formed farmer cooperator studies that utilize insecticide treatments around the edges of soybean fields. Now what they found is a bit concerning. The insects tend to infest plants at early developmental stages, and according to UNL crop protection and cropping system specialist Justin McMechan, this makes insecticide treatments a bit trickier than usual. Uh, this insect appears to be hitting the crop at the V3 stage, uh, so growers are not attuned to applying an insecticide that early to soybeans. We don't have a lot of pests. Uh, in Nebraska that are like that, and so there's a lot of caution being taken. Uh, we've evaluated a number of chemistries trying to understand uh, their potential value, and unfortunately, uh, we get asked that question a lot, but we won't know the value till this fall when we harvest those, those plots. Um, so, so it's uh, also complicated by the fact of the timing around adult emergence. Um, in some indications, applying late uh, didn't do anything, um, and so, uh, but the same chemistry performed better earlier. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of little things to be sorted out. Growers did spray this year uh, for it, but uh, we're not sure to what extent uh, that'll be realized for benefit until this fall. Now, this is the first time in his career, and many other entomologists for that matter, who have addressed a pest problem in the state with no significant amount of information on the biology or ecology on a subject. While it has been a challenge to manage this problem and gain some sense of control, Justin says they've gleaned some valuable insights during their research. Now, while researchers will have to wait and see to analyze the results till the end of the season, some possible management solutions are becoming clearer, though they may not be too popular among producers.
Yeah, uh, I will not be a popular individual for, for stating this as a potential management practice, and it is yet to be seen its value until the end of the season, but planting date appears to have a significant impact on soybean gall midge infestation from our overwintering generation. Uh, so at the Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center, we've planted May 1st, May 15th, June 1st, June 15th, and July 1st. Our May plantings are heavily infested, about 50% of plants are infested in those plots and our June 1st was 3% infested. So a rapid drop. Uh, no grower will be excited by a June planting. Um, but it, if I was under significant pressure as a grower from soybean gallmage in previous years, uh, that would be part of what I might lean on. Currently, UNL Extension Specialists are recommending that you don't take any action against the pests so late in the season, as they are expecting emergence to continue into late August based on last year's observations. Now, one thing that surprised researchers was the emergence rate of the pest, the first round of soybean gall midge to be captured this season was around June 14th. Within a month, researchers saw the second generation of adults emerge, which matched the greenhouse data set from last year. However, the emergence period was roughly 12 times longer than anticipated, and due to this extended period of emergence, Justin tells me the first generation observed this year emerged early enough to interact with the overwintering generation. Now, this is an unusually rare occurrence for insects to reproduce with overlapping generations. Uh, Justin also tells me that groundwork is being laid out for next season's research efforts and that this is one pest that has researchers thinking outside the box to help ensure soybean producers are better prepared if the infestation continues. And since we're on the subject of keeping soybeans healthy, we'd like to take this opportunity to point out a crop disease that Nebraska producers are beginning to see again this season. A frog eye leaf spot can be pretty common, and if seen enough, some producers may want to consider a fungicide treatment to some of the more susceptible varieties of soybeans planted in the state. While many fungicides will do the trick, Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson-Zims points out a particular pathogen does have some resistance traits. The most important thing right now we want to let people know is that we do have fungicide resistance in this pathogen to the common QOI fungicides that used to be called strobilurins. And so if making a fungicide application to control frog eye, we recommend using a product that has active ingredients representing two or more classes of fungicides. Strobilurins still do the best job, but don't use them alone because that might lead to fungicide resistance. Now, if these issues have been problematic for you this season and you're looking for more information on the soybean gall midge or frog eye leaf spot, be sure to visit cropwatch.unl.edu. Troy, that's what I've got my eye on this week, so I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Bill. For our final story this week, today there are about 7.7 .7 billion people living on the planet. That's a lot of mouths to feed. And despite slowing global birth rates, by the year 2050, that number is estimated to rise to 9.7 billion. This isn't lost on educators here at the University of Nebraska. They're utilizing a three-year, nearly $1 million grant from the National Science Foundation. Dr. J.M. Sabaya is leading a team trying to stimulate interest in the food, energy, water nexus through gaming. Once again, here's Market Journal's Bill Dodd. Can you work on that while maybe you play the games a little bit? The year is 2050. Our population has grown by 2 billion people and our agricultural sustainability is at risk. That's the premise of a new game being created by UNL professor J.M. Sabaya and his team on the East Campus of UNL. So the game is about teaching youth about systems thinking and uh, trying to teach about the complexities involved in the act production, how different systems are interconnected, and how they could use science-based decision-making to solve the, solve the problems of food production in the world, feeding the whole world. The idea came to Sabaya while he was watching his son and his friends play the popular video game Madden and seeing that they could virtually change the outcome of past Super Bowl matchups. And they were trying to change the outcome of the game. They were replaying the fourth quarter and then change the outcome of the game. When they were playing, I thought that like, well, we have the science-based model for crop production, mm -hmm. the hydrology, the climatology, and the beef pro growth, all of those things we have. So and we have all the data, market economy data, everything for the last 30, 40, 50 years, complete data set. So can somebody go back and then play those scenario out? Yeah. Can they make a sustainable decisions to change the outcome? And can we even forecast and go until 2050 
and feed the growing population. The game utilizes crop growth models, weather records, all available weather models, and soil profiles among other data that goes through an output model. Meanwhile, the player is saddled with the task of deciding what crops to grow, irrigation management, fertilizers, breeds of plants, livestock, about every other agricultural decision one would have to make in an actual farming scenario. However, you don't need to be an ag expert to play. So our goal is to make sure that this game is attractive for the urban kids too, right? If we just make, for, uh, make entertaining for the rural kids, then it's a failure. So we want to teach the urban kids that ag is a high tech and a high risk profession. And you can use model based decisions and then they can solve big challenges in this world. So far, this project is two and a half years in the making and has relied heavily on student support to see it come to fruition. One of those students is biological systems engineer major and Los Angeles native, Ashley Slattery. Lincoln, Nebraska is the smallest town I've ever lived in. I grew up in Los Angeles, California, so, and I know nothing about agriculture, um, but it's, it's been fun, you know, um, learning about it through this process. And, you know, I've had to Google, like, how big is a tractor? Because I just didn't know that. So it's a learning experience. With a fantastic concept and a team of bright young students leading the way on programming, this game has the potential to influence an entirely new generation of ag enthusiasts. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. The Agpocalypse team tells us they're always making updates to the game and a free public version will be available for download soon. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, we'll have some updates regarding agricultural trade with China. Plus, we'll give a preview of the annual Husker Harvest Days event. Hope to see you right back here next time. Till then, I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.